Thank you all for being here, and um, thank you for taking the, the time out of this is very packed um, meeting to talk with me some more about what I started talking about this morning. If, if you were, were most of you there at the opening this morning? Okay, so for those of you that weren't, catch up. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to do is to talk about three things. Um, one is legacy, which I started talking about this morning, and then also conversations and most particularly the ones we're not having, and the idea of influence. I think those are the three things that are really um, occupying my time right now and um, helping me sort of reshape what I'm going to um, do from here on. As you heard me say this morning, I realized suddenly that I wasn't done. And uh, so now I have to figure out what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do that. And um, it's actually with great joy that I... I embark upon that because I've found out a lot of things about my own practice and about um, perhaps conversations that we haven't been having around me exploring the concept of legacy. I think I did, as many people do, waited until the end of my career to say, aha, what about legacy? And what does it mean and, and how will I know of what it is? And I began doing a lot of reading on it. And as I said earlier this morning, it's really the simple definition of um, what it is that you leave behind that's valuable to others when you leave a job or you leave a profession. And for me, it's leaving the profession or at least leaving a job. And um, that was probably one of my first realizations is that you don't ever leave nursing. I mean, we all know stories of people that keep reauthorizing re, um, their license when they're 90 years old. And actually, some of them are still working. Um, but... It's a, it's a profession that's been extraordinarily good to me over the years and that has given me opportunities I don't think I would have ever had had I chosen a different pathway. And so in reading about it, most of what I was reading was um, how people go about defining their legacy, how they look to define their legacy. And I was um, just privileged to have um, one of my colleagues, Jennifer Mensick, give me that question that I repeated this morning and actually the statement of, you don't get to define it, Pam. We'll define it for you. And we'll define it based on what people take from your practice and take from your role modeling and take from whatever you do. And that becomes valuable in the way in which we develop. And if you want to know about your legacy, start asking people what it was that you did and what it was that was important to them. So I've been doing that as well. And what I've um, really discovered is that most of it is um, not what I would have thought. It's um, small things, small little pieces. And they all kind of put together in a, in a different kind of a picture than I would have said. I, I said this morning, and I'm sincere, my legacy at AONE is, is the fellowships. And I know you're out there, so I'm going to ask the fellows that are out there to stand up. So the small charge that I have for you is the future is in your hands. <laughs> and we know that. We know that it's going to be our younger, our early careerists, the people that will be taking over when some of us choose to, to step down from full time. And I'm redefining the, the, what I did uh, last year. I didn't retire. I stepped from full time to something else and to do something else that is going to be as enjoyable for me as the work that I've done all along. And so legacy. Is, is something that we talk about is happening at the end of your career. But if we were really being uh, proactive about this, we would begin talking about it much earlier in our careers to ask people, what am I doing that's helping you? What could I do more of? And what am I doing that I'm not even aware of that's helping you? And really focus on getting a much better handle on what our own legacy is for ourselves. Because in the end, legacy is two pieces. It's what you think you did. But more importantly, it's what other people think you did and know you did because it impacted their lives. And if we begin to have those conversations early, then we might help people move in a very different way towards this concept of moving from full-time leadership role to something that's um, less um, time-consuming. The gift you get with re retirement is um, you get to pick what you do, who you do it with, and when you do it. And when someone said that to me, it sounded so simplistic. 
I just think it's got to be more to it than that. But there isn't. There really isn't. And it's this ability to, first of all, know what it is you're passionate about because you don't want to do things that you don't enjoy anymore. Like you have, there's work we have to do. When you're retired, there's very little of you have to do's. Oh, there are, but you don't file them that way. And there's a lot more about figuring out what do you love? What are you passionate about? What really makes you happy and makes it joyful you for you to do that work? And like I said, when I started talking with people about it and people started telling me, it gave me a different picture of what it was I was going to be leaving within my practice and what it was that I want to preserve as I move into whatever this next role is. What do I want to keep of that? What do I want to make sure that I'm, um, I'm, I'm continuing to develop it? And most importantly, I'm continuing to give it. Because that's the generosity that you get towards the end of your full-time career, is the ability to be extremely generous because you want to be, not because you have to be. And that brings me to the conversations that I think we need to start having. And the ones I would like to see us have more and more is the whole continuum of our leadership practice talking with one another. And the people that are further into their career talking much more with the people that are just entering that career and really understanding what is it that we each have to learn. One of my favorite books is The Zen of Mentorship. And in it, it says that the mentor always has to be prepared to be the mentee in the relationship. And the mentee always has to be prepared to be the mentor in the relationship. And that it's always this give and take. And I think I'd like to reset our conversations around leadership so that we're not siloing ourselves into, I'm an early careerist, I'm a late career, ooh, that doesn't sound right, does it? I'm, I'm a seasoned careerist. Um, <laughs> and blend those conversations so that we're having a very rich conversation about what does the community of leadership need? What do we as leaders need to feed each other? Not, not this downward or upward. It's, it's really more within that circle of, of how we all practice. And that's what brings me then to influence. How are we going to use the influence that we could have if we were a much more unified leadership community? How would we influence differently? And we are really needed right now. We're absolutely needed. If you're watching the, the news and how healthcare is progressing or not progressing through Congress, I think it becomes pretty evident pretty quickly that this is serious time for the way in which we define health care of the future. And I think that nurses have the ability to influence. You've heard that said throughout the, the whole day today about nurses need to be, I love the, the person that said, it is our table. Um, I wouldn't claim it quite that way because I think it's our table. And I think that that's one of the things that nurses can bring is that sense of team, that sense of the ability of their... It is a round table. It is not ahead of the table. We all have equal voices, and we all need to bring them to bear on the problems that we have facing us and how we use that influence. The other is the influence of how we influence as um, the leaders that are just entering their career, how they're going to progress. And we know that they're going to do it very differently than it's been done in the past. It, it just has to be that way. That's going to change as well. We've done a lot of discussion within the community about how care is transforming, but we need to also talk about how leadership is transforming. And people that are just entering it in have some very different ideas. And if you don't think that's so, talk to them. And it's the way in which they're going to shape their leadership. And it won't be the way I've been a leader. It won't be. But it'll be something even more exciting, I think and something that will be very adapted to the kind of environment that we're working in. We've learned to live with ambiguity. They have been born into ambiguity. And it's just like the digital age. You know, my kids are wired differently than I am. I know every time I pick up my phone that they're not on the same wire I am. And I think that that's, that's the way in which we need to begin to look at leadership, that it is emerging into something very different because our environment is very different and because we're living in a very ambiguous, not clear pathway of where we're going to go. So the skill sets that they're going to need are going to be very different. And I think what would be wonderful is, is in this new conversation, if what we could do is talk to each other about what we've learned, what our experience has been, and how we've adapted it, 
and then be willing to, to hear how somebody else might choose to approach that differently, but then work together on, on who will be the leader in the next 30 years. What are they going to do? What are they going to pay attention to? And how do we get prepared for that? And then for those of us that are um, choosing to move out of the full-time into the part-time, I think that there is a sense of wisdom that we have on how we've worked and how we've um, addressed our challenges. And we do have things that we know that have been life experiences that we can add to that. And that, need, that needs to meet with what's happening with our early um, entry leaders in such a way that it's um, it's a positive from both sides and not a right or a wrong. It's going to be different. That's all. It's just going to be different, which is the heart of diversity anyway, is learning to live and love the differences that we all have. So those are the things that I've been really um, looking at. And, and in thinking about, so where do you influence, the ones that are really starting to kind of come home for me are boards where decisions are being made. Nurses have, have a really important role to play on that. The coalition to get nurses on boards, I think, it was the early instigator of all of that on a national basis. But we need to keep doing that. We need nurses bringing their knowledge and bringing the way in which they interact, the way in which they process, all the skill sets that, that we have that we can bring forward. Phyllis Critic, who is, I think, uh, one of the best negotiators and um, individuals known to engage with conflict has always said that nurses bring all the raw material to the table to be outstanding negotiators and conflict managers. They just need to shape them a little differently and they need to package them so that they can be used differently. But if you look back on how you have entered in and been socialized within nursing, the people skills, the relationship skills, the communication skills, the way to read body language, the way in which you can go into a room and size it up pretty quickly on what's happening within the dynamics. All of those things that have just become part of the intuition that we use in, as far as how we work and our ability to teach, our ability to mentor, all of those are going to become absolutely essential, not just for nursing, but for the whole team, for everybody that's engaged in this, because nobody really has a clear map. And if they do, I'm not buying a bridge from them, that's for sure. And I think the skills that we bring around the listening and the communication and influencing and, and most specifically around relationship management will serve us all well, but it will also serve healthcare well. So that's what I'm trying to do is figure out how to reshape my not full-time job into the things that I could still offer to the dialogue, still offer to the conversation, and still begin to continue to understand what my legacy was. Because each and every one of us have a legacy. It's not, it's not just one person that has that. We all have that. We have it in however it, it gets um, described and experienced by us. But you need to start working on it early. You need to start understanding how other people see you. And you need to be able to use those experiences to give back as others um, move through their, their career trajectory together. So I'd like to invite us all to create those conversations, start having different kinds of conversations about leadership, and really bringing the whole community of leadership together around um, learning how to be better influencers in the things that we need to be in the future. So those are my thoughts. And what I'd like to do is I'd really like to hear from you of am I on, or on the right path here? Am I, am I looking at the right things? And if I'm not, tell me. I might listen to you, I might not. But <laughs> that's the other thing I get to do now. And more importantly, it, it is that conversation that I want to see begin. And it, the only way you can do it is start talking. So would anyone like to jump in and take it from here? And come on up. And the Hello. Hi, David. In the spirit of practicing gratitude, I oh. want to talk about what your legacy means to me and what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for you, to you for engaging me to explore how, how I might become a better leader in almost every interaction I've ever had with you. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Also, for introducing me to global nursing leadership. I've had the opportunity to travel internationally with you several times, and I've been amazed at the way that you um, size up things internationally, and um, that introduction um, to global nursing for me was one of the um, neatest parts of my career, so thank you for that. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about um, the global nursing leadership issues and um, where you see 
us working in that arena in the future as a profession. Oh, I, that's one of my passions. I can talk about that forever, but I won't. Um, <laughs> um, I think that probably the most important thing about global right now is that um, we, we are so connected internationally. And I fear sometimes that the United States will get a little bit of isolationist around that and that we won't stay as engaged as we need to. Um, even something as simple as the baccalaureate, <laughs> she says it with a smile on her face, that's already been accepted in many countries. The Bogota uh, Agreement made the baccalaureate the minimum requirement in, um, in Europe for the European Union for the purposes of mobility so that people could move from country to country. And they've, you know, that's, that's what they've moved. I had a colleague internationally say to me at one point, um, is America going to be the least educated workforce in the world? And I, you know, of course not. I said, well, then how are you moving people faster? How are you doing that faster? And the whole, the whole concept around international, just the way we frame and language it, we have chronic diseases. Those things that we define as chronic diseases in our international community are called non-infectious disease and because their whole world was shaped around it was, it was infectious diseases that was the major problem. We solved that years ago. And now they're coming around to having infectious diseases become controlled more, but they're also having people age and move into chronic illness, and that's new to them. And the fact that they, they named it non-infectious diseases was so profound to me that it really showed this real difference between the way we've looked at our health care and the way the rest of the world has looked at their health care. So those are the conversations we need to have with our international colleagues to, um, to understand how they're managing. And if you've ever traveled internationally, you know that um, just about Every country in the world uses less resources than we do in healthcare and still can deliver some pretty amazing results. And I always have to go through a sort of a, a mental debrief period when I come home because if you've, been over, if you've been overseas and then you come home and then you hear people you know, complaining about something, you have to stop yourself because what we usually are complaining about is something that is um, part of our excess resource and we take it for granted, because it's our reality. It's the way we are. But those resources are not the same in the rest of the world, and yet they're delivering outstanding patient care. And they know their patients, and they know how to do that care with very limited resources. Doesn't make it easy, but they've figured out ways to do that. So we have so much to learn from them. They can teach us so much about changing the way we utilize our resources, and they can teach us so much better around public health and how to look at health as a right and how to look at health as caring for the whole community. Uh, we have some in the healthcare that think they've discovered that. That, you know, well, that, oh my goodness, there's this thing called continuity of care. There's this thing called public health and we're gonna make it all better. But it's always been there. It's always been there. And nurses have always been in that space. Always, and that's where nurses are across the world. And a lot of the healthcare in this world is delivered by nurses in their communities because there are so few physicians available in those communities. So our role in that is to be um, teacher in some aspects because I think our leadership is well developed, very well developed, and people look to us for that. They use our competencies. They use our competencies around defining leadership and teaching leadership but they can teach us about how to truly do this continuum of care and to blend public health with the community health and how we go about doing that. So it's a learn and it's a, it's a mutual relationship that I think we can have. And we can't be isolationist about it. And we have to go in with open arms that we're gonna learn a lot more than we probably have to teach. Anything else? Weren't you gonna ask something, Denise? Well, last year I mentioned this when you were being recognized as retiring, that I was in the room at AONE when you were made the CEO, and there was an excitement throughout the room. We thought we were going places, you know, and we did. We are. But uh, when you were speaking about legacy, I thought this morning, it's been thinking off and on all day, really the legacy about what you're speaking, it's not what we take away in our thought or emotions, I guess you'd say, but it's inside us, that spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are 
when I reflect on what you've done for AONE, and then probably for many of us, it's that inspiration inside us that you can't quantify, but that sparked us year after year after year. And then when you think about legacy, look what then I've done with that spark mm -hmm. to the people with me, and then those people with their spark. So the legacy is that spark just keeps going and it never really goes out. And mm -hmm. we don't think enough about that. We think about it intellectually, but mm -hmm. today I thought that's the thing about legacy is what you've reached inside people. So you've done mm -hmm. that, and then I think look how many people we have sparked because of that. So mm -hmm. legacy is really good, and it makes you think it's not about intellectual. It's about what we did inside people. Well, we did. And your legacy is pretty powerful because you did a lot of stuff in a lot, lot, lot of people's lives and in their hearts. Well, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. But you all have. You all have touched lives. Hello, Pam. Hello. So I'm Maureen. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just want to say, you know, I'm feeling so emotional about this, that the encounter of leaving, leading, um, leaving an impact. Twice I called you up, <laughs> thanks to your assistant and your persistence. I met with you when I was a mm -hmm. manager. Yeah. And you made it happen with your busy schedule. We met in a restaurant twice. You talked to me, you encouraged me. <laughs> and that twice you made that impact on me to say, yes, you can do it. Yes, you can operate in this chaos. It's more chaotic now <laughs> than it was then. But I just want to thank you. Um, you may not know what you have done for me, but I always tell people, I said, Pam made such an impact on me. Well, thank and you. And the Center for Nursing Leadership and all that work you did at the Center for Nursing Leadership mm -hmm. made me the kind of authentic person I am today. So I thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So also speaking about um, legacy and touching on what the other people have said is the biggest gift that I think that you gave to us was um, access and acknowledgement. And to think, uh, I was lucky, I was a 2013 fellow, and there's 30 of us, and here's the CEO of AONE, spending four weeks out of the year sitting in a meeting room with us and sharing her uh, expertise and support. It's just, uh, it was life changing for all of us. So um, access and acknowledgement, because I would say now uh, as nurse leaders, there's so many frontline staff that just want their CNO to stop and say hello and mm. to say you do great work, and yet so many times we don't do that, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. Here's some of your learnings from the fellows. From the fellows, ooh. With them here? <laughs> <laughs> now we're nervous. Yes, you should be, you should be. I think I've, um, the, probably the thing that I've learned the most is how smart our early career star. You're really smart people. And I've learned that um, we haven't always created the best environments for that smart to show up. And um, that's, I think, one of the reasons we stayed so committed to the, to the fellowship is because you bring people together and you hope they're going to get along. And I was always um, empty and I would kind of take bets on how long it would take for the group to click. And some would be right away, some would take maybe one day, two days, but then suddenly they would be what we wanted a fellowship to be, which is that body of colleagues that you'll be with for the rest of your life in some way or another. And we didn't, we never had a class that didn't demand to know that they were the best. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we were tricked a couple of times um, in... <laughs> I am not going there, Amy. <laughs> I am. She wanted to know which one really was. But I think that for what that always signified for me was that, that sense of excellence that they had, that sense of excellence around we can be really excellent leaders and still have fun when we do it. Because believe me, they had fun, I think, unless you lied to me, I don't know. But I think watching that, watching that first part of the fellowship start and watch how people left a year later was always a, just thrilling, absolutely thrilling to watch. So I learned that changing people um, inside takes a long time. And it takes, um, it takes that concentrated effort of focus on them, of paying attention and making sure that um, you're 
you're letting people know that you know that they're good and that you keep that for a, a, an extended period of time and that's your outcome at the end. It's not you know a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. It's the sustained approach to someone's development that I think makes a huge difference. And I learned that in the fellowship, that you have to do that. And that the other thing I learned was the importance of relationships across um, state lines. Maybe that's the best way to say it. The, the, what happens in the fellowship is it, it's, a, it's a community across states. It's from, it's from all over the country. And I, when I thought back on it, I didn't have that until I joined AONE in my career. And I was well into my career by the time that happened. And so I think the ability to um, give people a chance to develop that kind of a network. And I, I hear you guys talk all the time that you know, you're still talking to each other. They're still you know, asking questions of each other. And that becomes the kind of heart of your network. I've been fortunate in my career. I have a couple of those. And I still reach out to them. But I think if we can instill that in so many different groups, then we create a very tight net that holds people safe and lets them catch you when you don't want to tell anyone else. You'll tell a colleague that's maybe not in your place and let, let yourself be vulnerable, as she talked about today. It's a lot easier to be vulnerable with someone that you don't have to you know, sit with every single day. And when you give that as a gift to someone, it's just remarkable to see what they do with it. So I learned a lot from the fellows. I also learned how to laugh a lot. And um, yeah, and to trust that they would all make good decisions because they always have. Pam, we've focus, we're focusing now on your legacy as a professional and as a nurse, but all of us have multiple roles. Mm -hmm. I know you're a spouse oh, and a parent. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> as well as a professional. What kind of reflection have you been doing about as? you know, now you're stepping into another phase of your life. How, are, how have you been reflecting on those multiple roles and, and the intersections of those roles and mm -hmm. perhaps share some of your wisdom uh, about that? Because we all are juggling uh, those yeah. multiple roles. Yeah. Well, I learned very quickly that the only reason I was successful in my career was the support from that, that group. Um, for those of you who don't know my husband, he... Um, he retired earlier than I did and made it possible for me to do this job because he was, he was there you know, keeping up the home front. That's why my comment this morning of me being home full time was a bit of a jolt. Um, <laughs> and that um, what's happened now is the ability to really stand back and look at that as the whole and to, and to realize how some of that had become pieced. But there was, there was always a, a priority. I think it's, it's what you only have 24 hours in the day. Nobody gives you more than that. And they also don't give you less. And you have to decide how you're going to spend that. And so the ability to prioritize, I would have probably made different priority choices 10 years ago um, now that I reflect back on them. Because the world didn't fall apart because I chose not to do something. And I think you get that perspective of um, we're all dispensable. And there are some things that are worth um, staying up late for, and there's some that just aren't. You know, and, and my mom used to always have a saying, I said, if you're not going to remember the angst 10 years from now, then don't start it now. <laughs> and it, there was a lot of wisdom in that. On Think about how we get so tight around you know, something that, oh, we have to do this, we have to do this. Well, now wait a minute. Do you? you know, do you have choices? And do you have you know, this, um, this it's not an infinite energy that you have. It's a finite amount of energy. And so how do you choose to use it, and where do you choose to use it? And I probably would have placed things in different places, and I'm realizing that now. Um, but I also am realizing that I kept my core solid. My family was my core, and they had wonderful ways of reminding me if I forgot. And it's, um, it's the ability to, to keep that in, in mind. And then... Um, Cheryl Hoying is the one who uses the phrase um, life harmony, not life balance. And, and I think it's, um, it is right on the money because balance signifies that you're even. 50-50, that's balance. Harmony is like a chord of music. It goes up and down. And sometimes you're 100% at work, and you have to be. But sometimes you need to be 
80% at home and 90% at home. And I think that that's, that's the discipline perspective that um, I think I'm learning now that I, maybe I could have done better, of being much more disciplined about um, who, gets, who gets the majority of my energy and when do they get the majority of my energy. And sometimes I get it, you know, lo and behold. And that's, so I think that's, that's part of, of how we do it is, but doing that earlier on and, and making sure that you know what those priorities are. She said that this morning, know what your life priorities are. And I would say also know what your, um, what your, your harmony um, balance is going to be and how you're going to, how you're going to um, do that for, for yourself. Nobody else does it for you. If you notice, nobody says, oh, gosh, I think you should have eight days off. You know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Oh, if you don't use your vacation, that's okay. That's fine. I've got plenty of work for you to do. So, I, you know, you definitely take your vacation. You definitely take the time that you need. You feed yourself. One of my great instructors was Gene Thin Elk, who was a Lakota um, healer. And um, he, he always marveled at the Western way of thinking that um, you could care for your community by emptying your whole self into it. And he said, we, we believe that you have to be full inside in order to have the energy to care for your community and your family. And we kind of do it backwards. He said, so fill yourself first. You know, it's like the, the thing on the airplane where it's put the mask on yourself first and then put it on other people. And I think we need to practice that a little more. So that... Pam, this morning the opening speaker stated how nursing was going to lead the way. Yeah, I hope so. My question is, and you talked about influence, <laughs> how will we do that? Well, I think we have to find our voice, and you have to use it. Finding it's half the battle, but then you have to know how to use it. And I, um, I used to marvel at people that say, why isn't AONE doing this? And what I always wanted to say, but it didn't, was, well, why aren't you doing it? You know, you can do it as easy as I can do it. And so that this, this thinking that we have sometimes that someone else is going to do it and we'll help them, but I don't have to do it. And I think if nursing is really going to do this, they're going to have to step up, like all of us. Step up and say what you know. You know, it's, it's like going to Congress. You know, you, you, people are, the fellows have told me that they're terrified before they go up. And then when they go up, they go, they're all kids. <laughs> I'm older than all of them. And you're the expert. And I always tell people, when you go to Congress, you are the expert. You know exactly what you're saying, and you need to own that and hold it. And I think we need to not only do that in Congress, but we need to do it wherever we are in a very politically correct way of um, using our, our good em emotional intelligence, our good way of, of presenting ourselves as leader, and, and to be able to speak to that and speak to it well. But we need all voices. We can't depend on one or two people being able to carry the water on this. And it's wherever you are. If you're at the bedside, if you're in a boardroom, no matter where you are, you have to be able to speak to what is the value nursing brings to this and what is the value that healthcare brings to this. Because what I wouldn't want to see is have it be nursing. It's all about nursing. It's not. It's about the team that's going to be delivering the care and the family that's included in that team. So we're good team leaders, and we're good at helping that, those relationships of team. But we have to speak up. We have to, and we have to be articulate about it. And we have to, you know, it's, you need to know who your audience is so you know how to frame it. And we've all done those exercises of, you know, if you're talking to somebody that's um, just likes the details, then you just give them the details. You don't say, oh, the world is beautiful today, because that's not going to help it. They want to know exactly what's going on. Read your audiences. Know exactly how to present your information. Know the languages you need to use. We all have different languages. Nursing has its own but so does finance, and so does everyone else. And we, we don't expect, you can't expect other people to learn our language. It'll take too long. I think it's our responsibility to learn the other languages because it's easier for us, I think. And you can translate. You've been doing it all your lives. Uh, I was reflecting, Pam, on the comment you made about how for some of us who are older, we've learned how to adapt to ambiguity, but our younger leaders were born into ambiguity. Mm -hmm. I, that was kind of a stunning comment for me and really thinking about the difference. And this morning, someone made the comment also about um, 
nursing being kind of the eye of the storm. And when you think about that eye, it kind of is the center of the cause of chaos. But instead, I think the meaning was the steady eye mm -hmm. while things are swirling madly around you. So I found myself thinking, you know, is, is part of the legacy the learning how to self-lead and self-nurture to the point where you can be the steady eye? Mm -hmm. And even the comments that people make about what we learned, we learned in kindergarten that what is your legacy is not what you did, but how you made people feel. Yeah. And Pam, I would say to you that I think that's a lot of what people are saying to you today, that you've had this unbelievable capacity to make people feel steady in the eye of the storm and to feel seen and loved and cared about. And it's powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you're going to make me cry. Thank you.